Well, good morning, church. Morning. How we doing this morning? A little chilly? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, hopefully this is like the last gasp of winter before we move into warmer, warmer weather. Just in time for the snowbirds to come back. Well, uh, we're glad you're here to worship with us this morning. We've got a new song that we're going to sing. Uh, it's called Everything You Do, and I uh, hope it's pretty easy to follow along with, but we'll find out as we go. Let's, uh, let's start this morning with a word of prayer. Lord God, we thank you for this beautiful morning you've given us to come into your house and to worship together. God, I just pray that this morning that all the distractions that we might have brought in with us, you'd block them out so that we'd hear your word and we'd worship you with, with open hands, open hearts, and open minds. Lord God, let your Holy Spirit just cover this place and pour out upon us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand. So this song, it's, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk you through the chorus real quick. It says, I'd be lost if it was not for you. I'm in love with everything you do. I will only sing your praise. Jesus, you're the one who made me new. I want nothing else apart from you. I will only sing your praise. I think a lot of us can identify with that. That first line, especially, I'd be lost if it was not for you. We would all be lost if it was not for Jesus Christ. Amen.
been strong on you. Jesus, I belong to you. Amen. When all I see is the battle. See my victory when all I see is the mountain. You see the mountain move, and as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I'm safe with you. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees, with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you, and every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. we know that nothing is impossible for you. And God, I pray that in this room that we will be reminded of that. And Lord, if we need that miracle to happen in our lives, to be reminded of that, I pray that today is the day that you allow that to happen. Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. Lord Jesus, we worship you this morning and only you. For you are the way maker, the miracle worker, the promise keeper and the light in the darkness. Father, continue to work on our hearts in this room this morning. In your name we pray. Amen.
are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Behind your regrets and mistakes Come today, there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy From the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling
know, that song is all about the gospel. And if you've never accepted the Lord as your Savior, if you've never come to him and say, Lord, I'm a sinner, I need your forgiveness, I want to follow you with my whole heart, today is the day. We invite you to come to an altar. Bow your knee to Jesus. You can come to an altar. You can sit in the front pew. If you need prayer today, we invite you to come. And someone will come and pray with you and believe with you for God to touch you. As the worship team continues to sing, let's make our way down front. We'll sing that chorus again. to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, oh come to the altar, the Father's arms are open Father, we thank you today for the precious blood of Jesus. We thank you, Father God, that we can be forgiven. We thank you, Lord, that we can be set free, that we can be new creations in Christ. Father, we thank you for your magnificent love and your unfathomable grace that you poured out to us. And Father, we, we just rest in your presence today and ask you, Father, to accomplish whatever you want to in our lives. We yield ourselves to you today. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to ask you to take a moment this morning. And I want you to think about, think about your neighbors, think about your neighborhood, your community. And while you're seated this morning, as some are praying, I'm going to ask you to pray. Pray that your community will come to know Jesus. Pray for your neighbors, pray for your co-workers that God will touch them and save them. time. What a 
Thank you so much, worship team. Isn't God just so wonderful? Isn't he just so good and gracious to us? Um, kids, right now, you are dismissed. Really get the words out, and they're out. Offering team, if you would come and wait on us. We have a couple different ways you can give here at church. You can give in the black offering, the black boxes in the back as the baskets go by, or you can go online or... Um, you can text. But either way, we have many ways for you to do it. It's between you and God. And that's what the key is for us in giving our tithes and offerings is giving that up to God. So if you go, to, go with me in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for a beautiful and a warm building we have to come to. God, we thank you for this fellowship that we have at this church. We thank you for how good you are to us every single day. The days were difficult. The day we, um, we don't want to listen, we don't want to follow God, you're still good, and we're so grateful for it. I pray that you'll bless these tithes and offerings, God, and you'll bless the rest of our service, God, that you are present here because you are here. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, I have more announcements than we usually do, so bear with me, all right? Life-wise, um, this is the last week that we are going to be doing donations. Um, it's the red box right out there. Um, donations goes towards, the, the, of course, the Life-wise in itself, but, of course, it helps each dancer win, I guess, <laughs> for lack of a better word. So if you donate, it helps... Sarah and I, it boosts our points and all that stuff. That's their rules, not mine. Uh, we're doing a prayer vigil again, um, Good Friday. So sign up 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. There's a sign-up sheet right out there. Uh, we had a great turnout for the last one, and it was half hour ago. It's not hard to pray for a half hour. When I signed up, I was like, oh, my gosh, what am I going to pray for for a half hour? And then I think when it was done, I thought, wow, that went by really fast. Um, but it's a great time for us to force ourselves to slow down and stop and pray and take things to God and actually sit and listen to what God has to say to us. Our family fun night is March 31st, 6.30 to 9. You can sign up if you want to bring a soup or a dessert. And if you don't want to bring anything, still come. Just because you don't bring anything, that's not the goal. The goal is to have fellowship and to hang out. We're going to have plenty of board games and card games. It's, it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, our eggs that the youth are selling, this is the last week for those. We're going to be make, making them last week. So if you don't sign up to buy them, we're going to make you come and help make them. Don't worry, you'll never want peanut butter again if you did that. Our sign-up sheet is right out there, um, and I will be out there, too, to answer any questions. We'll be making them next weekend, so then the following Sunday, you can pick them up. Uh, we are having a child dedication, two of them, because we have so many kids. We need, to, we need to break it up. This is a beautiful stage, but it will not be able to hold our families. So one is on April 16th, and the other is June 18th. If you are interested, you can mark it in your bulletins and turn it in, or you can come talk to one of the pastors or the, the elders. But it, oh man, it's just so many kids to dedicate, so many kids to, to pray over, so many families to love on. Oh my gosh, it's going to be awesome. Um, and then last, if you're interested in getting baptized, 
come talk to one of us um, for, for spring. I know we do it out in the pond once a year, but baptism is not a once a year thing. Baptism is a, a heaviness, a weight on someone's heart, and they, they're ready to take the next step. I'm not going to be the one to tell you, well, we do it once a year, so you have to wait. If you have this burning desire and you want to get baptized, come talk to us. You can mark it in your bulletin. Come talk to one of us pastors. We'll make it happen. We can do it right in here. I'm not, we're not going polar diving back there. We're going to do it in here, so don't let that deter you. But come talk to one of us if that's a, um, an interest you have. So in Defiance, Ohio, we have the confluence of the rivers, of the Maumee and the Auglaise come together. And I guess in the old days, when there was a baptism, they would do it whatever month it was, could be January, they would just go down to the river, cut a hole in the ice and baptize. <clears throat> so if I think, you know, if we're really committed No, I think we'll do it inside in a heated baptistry. And then we're going to put some jets in there, and then the pastors will use it during the week <clears throat> as a hot tub. I'd like to thank Pastor Caleb for his message last week. Uh, it was, was really good. And if you were not here, I encourage you to get online and, and take a listen to that message. Fantastic. And uh, So we are in a, a short series called Mission Focus. So uh, something that the church needs to revisit time and time again is purpose and mission. Uh, pastor John Maxwell, who used to pastor Skyline Wesleyan Church in California, about vision, he says, vision leaks. He says, people can hear about vision, they can understand vision, they can realize the importance of the vision, but in less than 26 days, they will forget about the vision. So every 26 days, we need to re-emphasize the vision because vision leaks. So that's what we're doing in this series is reminding us as a church, what is it that we are to be about? So God's desire for the church was that uh, the church would be a major impact player in the world. God's desire for his people would, would be that the people would be people of change. We would be people of influence to a lost and a dying world. When, when Jesus first talked about the church and the impact that the church would have, he spoke to Peter and said this, and now I'm going to tell you who you are, really are. You are Peter, a rock. This is the rock on which I will put together my church, a church so expansive with energy that not even the gates of hell will be able to keep it out. So the church was to be a, a divine organism of godly influence. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the church in Ephesus, reiterated the mission of the church. In Ephesians 3.10, his intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realm. The mission of the church is to make God known. And of course, we have our great commission uh, passage, which is Matthew 28. It says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the, of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. So there's somewhat of a pattern there, don't you think? So we, the church, the church of God, are to be on mission. We are to be the salt and the light to the world. We are to be ambassadors of the message of reconciliation, message of the love of God through Jesus Christ. So I have a little bit of a confession to make. I love Sunday morning church. 
I love coming to church. I love to worship. I love to sing praises to the Lord. I love meeting with great people on a Sunday morning. I love the Word of God. I love me a good sermon. And I love fellowship. You know, the simplest definition of fellowship, don't you? Pie and coffee. I love fellowship. But guess what? Pie is not the mission. I know it's tough to understand. Sunday morning church is not the mission. Worship, as we come together, is not necessarily the mission. Good sermons, while we like those, are not the mission. The mission is to share the good news of Jesus Christ with a lost and dying world. So how do we move ahead on mission? How, how do we as the church of God get motivated appropriately, seize the opportunity, and move ahead with our mission focus? So this morning I want to take uh, tackle a fairly lengthy passage of Scripture. So if you have a Bible or electronic device, you can go to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, very familiar story about Jesus and the woman at the well. John chapter 4. So beginning in verse 1, the Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour, so that's about three in the afternoon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that asked you for a drink, you would ask him and he would give, have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself and did also his sons and his flocks and herds? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me the water that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming back here to draw water. He said to her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you have said you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, believe me, woman, a time is coming when we will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called the Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. Then the disciples returned. Uh, let's go to verse 28. Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him to eat. When he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me to finish his work. Do you not say four months more and then the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. In verse 39, Many of the Samaritans from the towns believed in him because of the women's testimony. All right, it's a very lengthy passage, but 
in this narrative, we are going to find Jesus moving in a new direction. He is going off the beaten path. So I believe there's some insights from this uh, uh, connection between Jesus and the Samaritan woman that gives us some ideas about our mission that is in front of us. So if we're going to be Christ's ambassadors and touch other people, there are some things that we need to know and that we need to understand. There are some attitudes that we need to possess and we need to embrace. So the first item of importance is this. All people, everybody say all people. All people have value. We must not miss the significance of what is taking place in this narrative. It is significant and it, it doesn't make sense, especially in the culture at the time. It's unheard of. We have to remember that Jesus is a Jew and in his part of the world, there are rules for Jews when it comes to social contact. First of all, Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And second of all, a Jewish man does not strike up a conversation with a Samaritan woman. It is forbidden. No good Jew would even think of doing either of those things. But Jesus breaks the mold. He breaks the norms. He colors outside of the lines. And the question we ask is why? Why does he do this? He does this because he wants to send a message to his disciples and ultimately to us as well. And the message is this, all people have value. All people, regardless of their culture, regardless of their upbringing, regardless of their history, regardless of their sinful pasts, all people have value. I think one of the most incredible narratives in the Old Testament is the narrative about Jonah. And you remember that narrative, you remember the story. God said go, and Jonah said no. And what happened to Jonah? He ended up in the belly of a big fish. Now, where did God want Jonah to go? He wanted him to go to Nineveh. You remember why? Because God wanted the Ninevites to know about his grace. But Jonah said no, because as far as he was concerned, the Ninevites were beyond help. I mean, they were not worth the grace of God. Nineveh was one of the most evil, most corrupt, most twisted, most debased cities uh, in that time. And if you read the story, you see that God goes to pretty extreme measures to get Jonah to go to Nineveh. Now, why does he do that? Because God looked at the people of Nineveh and he said, those people are valuable. If we're going to move forward in mission as a church, we need to understand all people have value. Is there anyone who does not have worth? Samaritans have worth and value. Do Samaritan women who have had many men have value and worth? Everybody has value. Every human being created by God has worth and should be allowed the experience, the opportunity to understand and experience God's grace. So this is the first step. If we don't value people, then we won't connect with them. If we don't value people, then we won't, know, go, won't go and meet to them. We won't share with them. Uh, we won't take time for them. So you have to ask the question, each of us has to, what do we think of other people? What do we think of people who are not like us? What do we think of our boss or our coworkers? Or our classmates, you know, the ones that don't act like you. They don't think like you. Uh, they don't vote like you. They don't talk like you. Do we, do we write them off as simply unreachable? Are they worthless? Or are they worth the love of God? All people are redeemable. That's why the Holy Spirit says through Peter in 2 Peter 3.9, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Why? Because all people have value and worth. And then, 
The next lesson we learn is we need to get comfortable with the uncomfortable. Get comfortable with the uncomfortable. Now, there's a very in interesting verse right away in this passage that, that just kind of cracks me up a little bit. Um, in verse 4, it says, now he had to go through Samaria. In the uh, uh, ESV version, it says, he had to pass through Samaria. If you have the King James, it says, he must needs to go through Samaria. Now, I find that interesting. So you see before you a map of his travel. And he starts down in Judea, uh, Ephraim area. And you'll see a little dotted line around the right side of that map. Well, that's the typical uh, path for a Jew to get to Galilee. It's well known. It's not unheard of. You just simply go across the Jordan River to the east. You go up north. You pass back across the Jordan River, and you have gotten to Galilee without going through Samaria. Happens all the time. But Jesus says, I have to go through Samaria. No, you don't, Jesus. Have you not seen the map? It's right here on the PowerPoint. You don't have to go through Samaria. Just go around it, right? <clears throat> so obviously, there was a bigger picture in view here. There was someone that Jesus knew about who needed to hear about the Messiah. Some we, someone who needed to connect with Jesus. So if that meant being uncomfortable by going through Samaria, then so be it. So if mission is the mindset that we need to have, then we need to be like Jesus. We have to get comfortable with the uncomfortable. So traveling through Samaria was not comfortable for Jesus. He was going to be in, in uh, enemy territory, right? We church people can be so enamored with our own comfort. I mean, we are most comfortable around people who are just like us. We are most comfortable with people who like our style of music or like our style of preaching, who like our style of ministry. We don't want to be uncomfortable. But that's exactly what Jesus is showing us by going into and through Samaria. Years ago, uh, I had a couple who came in to, for some uh, marriage, uh, premarital counseling, uh, and uh, so we talked through all the things we have to talk about and talked about the wedding. And they said, uh, by the way, we want to have our wedding at one of the local bars. Because that's where we met. We've now understood that we've got to come back to the Lord. But we want to have our wedding there as a testimony to those we used to hang out with that we're making a new stand in life and committing to Jesus Christ as well as each other. Okay, so I went to the elders and I said, so what do you think about me doing a wedding at a bar? And they all said, yeah, go for it. So I did. I went in the front door. I took out my knife and I cut the smoke so I could get through to the back. And we had a wedding in the bar. And after the wedding, I sat down at the bar with a couple of guys. And uh, I think they were maybe under the influence a little bit. But, you know, they just kind of poured out their hearts. It's amazing what they talked about, you know. And, and so I, we were able to talk about church and talk about the Lord a little bit. That was not comfortable. That's not where I hang out. It was uncomfortable. So how uncomfortable are we willing to become so that we can be used by God? Am I willing to say that I need to go through Samaria? Am I willing to put myself in a position where, where I can share the gospel with people who kind of make me feel a little bit uncomfortable? Who's going to share that 
transformation message of Jesus with, with the drug, drug addict or the, the prostitute or the person that's living a gay lifestyle? Who's going to share the hope of Jesus with that person whose very life is in conflict to everything that I stand for? On my bookshelf in the office here is a book titled, No Perfect People Allowed, Creating a Come-As-You-Are Culture. So Pastor John Burke, uh, he's a pastor in Texas, wrote this book, and about uh, the difficulties of being uncomfortable when it comes to mission, he writes this. What do a Buddhist, a biker couple, a gay rights activist, a transient, a high-tech teacher, a Muslim, a 20-something single mom, a Jew, an unmarried couple living together, and an atheist all have in common? They are the future church of America. Now, they're not going to stay. Uh, you know, we're going to bring them into the church, but then we're going to encourage them in transformation to become more like Christ. So Jesus was in an uncomfortable situation. He was in a place where Jews feared attack and ridicule. And here he was talking to a woman something that was considered inappropriate. Yet Jesus was willing to be uncomfortable because the mission is more important than our comfort. The mission is more important than our preferences. So I think recent estimates is that there are over about 2 billion people who still are without the saving relationship uh, with God through Jesus Christ. What are we willing to do to meet them? Two billion people, and sometimes all we can think about is our own comfort. You know, we love our heat, we love our air conditioning, we love our cars, we love our nice homes and our luxuries. We love church, how we like church to be for us. But we have to begin to be, or be comfortable with the uncomfortable. Paul said it. He said, uh, though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many poss as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law. So as to win those not having the law. To the weak I became weak, to win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that by all possible means I might save some. So we may have to get comfortable with uncomfortable. And then, remember your purpose. So as we read this passage, we have to remember uh, that one thing tends to jump out. Above all, there was purpose. Why did Jesus have to go to Samaria? Purpose. Why did he have to go up to that particular well? Purpose. Why on that very date, on that very time, did Jesus decide to take this journey? It was on purpose. There was a Samaritan woman who needed to have a face-to-face -face meeting with the Messiah. You know, this was not just a chance meeting that took place because Jesus was thirsty and he just happened to be near a well with water and there happened to be someone there who could draw the water for him. And so in that case, all of this kind of comes together. Let's just have a conversation. Why does Jesus send all of his disciples away to get some lunch? Why not just a few? Why not keep uh, uh, with him a couple of, of his friends? Because of purpose. The purpose of God is to impact the world with the gospel. And that purpose triumphs everything else. What is our purpose as God's people? Is it our purpose to simply live a good life? Is it our purpose to be a good church member? Or, or just to be a godly father or a godly mother? Is it your purpose or your mission to provide for your family? Is it your mission to be a good student and graduate and get a job so you can have a nice life? Now, those are all good things. 
And those are all important endeavors. But you and I must be convinced that there is a deeper purpose, and that purpose is that we are the salt and light to a lost and dying world, and that we have a purpose to reflect Jesus to those around us, to our communities. We are to present the good news. Far too long the church has said, well, let's just build a program. Let's build a building. Let's get in a great speaker or a musical group, a great performer, something that will attract people. And then when they all come in, then we can cast our net and catch a few. But that's not God's idea. His idea was that we would be the church. The church is not a building. The church uh, is the people of God. And it is the church, the people of God, that are to be uh, the people in the community, connecting with others, making disciples. Years ago, I, I, I read about a very unusual situation that happened. Maybe some of you have heard this story. So uh, he is called Lawn Chair Larry. In 1982, Larry Walters decided to see his neighborhood from a new perspective. So he went out to Sears, yes, that used to be a place, <laughs> and bought a new aluminum lawn chair. Then he went to the surplus store and he bought 45 weather balloons and he filled them all with helium, and he tied them to his lawn chair. He took along some snacks, he took along a camera, and he took along a pellet gun to shoot the balloons so he could descend. What Larry did not count on was his rapid ascent that he would experience. Before he knew it, he was at 15,000 feet in the air. He did not anticipate the wind currents at that elevation, and, and instead of taking him to the remote parts, the winds carried him into Los Angeles airspace. Several airline pilots reported him to the FAA, and air traffic was stopped for two hours. This caused long delays across the entire country. He finally was able to shoot some of the balloons and descended into power lines where he got caught. The only thing that saved him from electrocution was the nylon rope that he used. When the electric company came, they had to shut off power to thousands of people for about a half hour. Soon after, he was safely grounded and cited by the police. Reporters asked him three questions. Were you scared? Yes. Would you do it again? No. Why did you do it? Because he said, you can't just sit there. Church, we have to ask ourselves that question. Are we just going to sit there? People need Jesus. And we who have the answer are content to keep our current relationships and not courageously step out for Christ. There are people all over this world at our workplaces, at our schools, in our communities who need to know Jesus. They need to have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And are we sitting, waiting, waiting for the pastor to do it, waiting for the elders, waiting for the trustees? Ephesians 4 says that God gave the leaders to equip the people for ministry. We are all ministers. We are all ministers for Christ. So at the end of John chapter 4, the Samaritan woman runs to tell others because she has discovered the answer that everyone needs. Do you know who has the answer that everyone needs? You do. I do. The answer is Jesus. So there are millions of people who are just like this woman at the well. They are, they are everyday people who are stuck in the cycle of sin. They are filled with shame. They are filled with remorse. They are existing in life, but not really living any kind of fullness of life. And just like this Samaritan woman, 
many people are just waiting for the right person to show up at the well. They need an encounter with one particular person, and that person is the Messiah, the Christ. So our mission is to be the bridge to Jesus. There's no other group on this planet that has this mission. There's no other organization or organism that will rise to the call to carry the message. And there is no other message. We are the church, and we have the message. We are the ones who can proclaim the good news to the poor, proclaim freedom for those trapped in sin and shame, to open the eyes of the blind that have been blinded by our enemy and proclaim that today is the day of the Lord's favor. Of the church's mission, Paul said this in the book of Romans. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? This morning in your bulletin, I believe you have an insert. And on the back of that insert this morning, I would like you to think of one person that you know that doesn't have that relationship with Jesus. One person that you know that has not had that experience of coming to the Lord through Jesus Christ. It could be a family member, it could be a coworker, could be someone at school, could be that person that works behind the cash register at the grocery store. And just picture them in your mind. This morning, I would like you to write their name down on the back of that insert. And I would like you to begin to pray for them and think and ask the Lord how he might use you to connect with them. I'm going to invite our worship team to come. And as they do, I would encourage all of us to recommit ourselves to our mission. We must dedicate ourselves to be the hands and the feet of Jesus to this lost and dying world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have called us. We thank you, Lord God, that we have experienced your love and your grace and your mercy. Lord, we know, Father, that you sent Jesus to the world and that the world through him might be saved. And Father, you you built the church as your messengers. And so Lord, I pray that you will give us wisdom on how we can be more effective for you. Father, I pray for those names that have been written down. Father, you know those people. You know that they need you. And Father, I pray that you will use us, people in this room, to connect with them, to touch them, We pray, Lord, that you just open our eyes to the opportunities that you have before us. And Father, we might might reap the harvest, which is white, which is ready. Father, continue to, to burden our hearts with those things that burden your heart. And we thank you for that. stand as we worship. How great the that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my 
sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe and out of the silence the roaring lion declared declared the grave has no claim on me that's kind of important right let's sing that again then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body
Father God, we thank you for such a beautiful morning. God, we thank you for your example on how to love people, your example on how to reach the lost. We thank you for coloring outside those lines and breaking those molds, God, so we don't get too trapped in our own little religion and our own agenda, God. I pray that, ah, God, I pray that we change how we do things, that we alter the way we do things to fit your example and your design. God, I pray that when we leave here, we take the church with us. We don't leave it here in this building. When we leave here, we're looking for lost people. We're looking to love people. We're looking to connect and build relationships with God. And if and when you urge us, I pray that we'll step out in faith and ask that person if we can pray for them or ask them if they want to hear about Jesus. God, I pray that you'll be with us. Yes, this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, church, so much for worshiping with us. Don't forget to take church with you when you leave. God loves you. We love you. We'll see you guys next week.